just like any other kid who walks in that gym and it's a tough gym the Ingle gym and uh, yeah I think it's I think it'll be a good move for him if that's what he wants and uh, we'll look, look forward to seeing him in the new year what was your experience with did you have to treat yourself a bit mean to no be a bit mean? I don't think so I, I think you're always hungry anyway you're always ambitious I didn't think about treating myself mean or anything like that just trying to satisfy your ambition that uh, and he probably felt the same but he needed a bit more you know he needed mm. to be in a tougher environment like Marvin Hagler he, he said like it's hard to get up and run at 5am when you're waking up in silk pyjamas <laughs> you know he used to take yourself away to Cape Cod and train like train the same way some fighters have to do that right. to detach themselves so not, you're always going to detach yourself from not regular life but just to have it a little bit harder you know mm. and um uh, He'd certainly get it in Sheffield. All right, no silk pajamas in the studio with us uh, right now. Adrian Russell from the 42 and Paul Burns are both here. As you've con con welcome, you've uh, both contributed to the Christmas sports book market uh, this year. Paul, yours has been a bit of a labour of love over the last uh, couple of years, I think, has it? Has, yeah, sure. It's something I suppose I've always wanted to do. Just never got around to doing it. Uh, love sport, obviously, and been lucky enough to be involved in sport for the last couple of years in the business and meeting great players and great managers and etc. So. It was something, an idea I had in my mind, like, you know, I always kind of wondered what was life like as a player, but what was life like after you finished playing? Yeah. Um, you know, it must be incredible to have such a career and then it's all over suddenly and how you deal with life after sport. Yeah, um, if, for people who don't know, you were the editor of the Sunday game for six decades? Yeah, yeah a while, right? Yeah, 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 maybe too long, some people would say. Um, yeah, from 2004 to 2016, so yeah, really enjoyed it. Um, it was great. I mean, GA would be my first love, yeah. love all sports, but particularly GA, so it was, uh, it was a great honour to you know, be involved in a programme that you kind of grew up with. And so the decision to write not just about GA though, about other sports as well, was that something that was clearly, you decided early on that you wanted to compare and contrast? Yeah, absolutely, sure. I suppose at the end of the day, the book, you know, was, was could have been a book about 14 GA players yeah. retiring, but I just felt that, you know, um, doing a number of different sports was better because of the, you know, people react in different ways in different sports, etc. So, you know, the number of GA players, soccer players, rugby, yeah. boxing, athletics, and I just wanted to vary it and, and, and do a number of sports. Joe Broadley obviously picked out the, the difference between Tony McCoy and the, mm. the brilliant line he has about sportsmen dying twice, mm. and uh, Henry Sheffield, who was like, well, I didn't really retire, I just went and played for the club, and mm. how they're kind of, you know, professional sports, and he obviously has his own specific point that he's making off the back of that, but mm. did you notice that, that the professionals were much more clean, clear, hard stop than the amateurs of the GAA? Absolutely, no question. I mean, you know, I just felt like that when I interviewed the amateur sports people, they felt it was kind of a softer landing to retirement because, you know, you play with your county like Henry for years, playing with Kenny, and then suddenly it's over, but you go back to your club and you go back to work on Monday morning and yeah. life is similar, might never be the same again, but you're still playing. Whereas if you're playing professional sports, you could be training on a Friday, playing on a Sunday, and your contract might be up Sunday night, and you're finished on Monday. So you have, you know, your contract's up, you're finished as a player. All your routine and, and the structure and, that you have in your life as a professional athlete is over. And it's like, what next, and what do I do now, what do I do tomorrow? Yeah. Before we just get on to Adrian, you guys have, uh, this is a collection of your best writing over the course of the year. Um, always difficult to pick which of your children are your favourites. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not necessarily, you know, top of the pops, as, uh, as we've been saying. It's, like it's not, you know, the 14 best um, pieces last year or this year, it's like hopefully something that kind of represents, you know, the, the broad spectrum of sports and different formats and tones or whatever. It was like kind of creating an album was the way we were kind of looking at it really sort of, you know, tonally it's different throughout the book and, but yeah, there was a lot of hair decisions I must say. And uh, people knocking on your door going, I mean, yeah, uh, maybe this one is a better choice. Or, <laughs> yeah, But well, that's good, I mean, it's an incentive, for, you know, you want to be in the book next year as well and you want your, your, your best stuff in there. Yeah, so also an amazing endorsement from Roy Thompson. Yeah. Um, now, like, I, I was one of the few people who thought that Wright Thompson Conor McGregor piece was really interesting and thought-provoking as mm. opposed to ridiculous. But anyway, we'll come back to that later. Uh, in these pages, the men and women of the 42 show once more whether the nation's best and most essential sports storytellers. Irish writers are as important as Irish games, and here at the intersection is something special. It's not bad, is it? No. How did you make... <laughs> what happened? <laughs> um, well, I suppose before the, the ESPN piece came out in the summer, he was in contact with, with us and various people on our team. 
as I'm sure he was talking to a lot of people, you know, you can see the work that went into that piece. Um, so we have people like Paul Dory who are obviously known in the MMA uh, game here, uh, Gavin Casey with boxing. So we were, we were chatting to him and then when the, the piece came out there was a big reaction. So that kind of relationship and that conversation continued. Um, so then, and he, he reads the site, well, he says he reads the site. So we said, it would be cool if, if he gave us a blurb presented it. Someone like Dave Hannigan is in another person we respect a lot. So yeah. um, we had to get that kind of endorsement for someone like that. It was really, uh, you know, amazing, really. I guess as well, the other thing is that um, people have spent time and you've invested in people who are writing longer form pieces, which we're all told is not the future of the internet. It's not going to work. The kids these days can only take tiny little bits mm -hmm. of information, but yeah. it's not true. It's interesting, yeah, I mean, this isn't, well, when we started this site, say, six, seven years ago, we were kind of trying to carve out a niche, and we, we became known, I think, as someone who, you know, we were a nimble team who reacted quickly and covered live sport, which wasn't necessarily done elsewhere, but in the past few years, we've been able to kind of add that layer of long form and uh, something that we feel passionate about, and the reaction, like, the book is there because under each of the, these pieces, there's someone saying, this should be in a book, why don't you kind of put a book together, so we're trying to give the people what they want, and, um, you know, I think the, the the audience want this type of stuff as well as the, the live vlogs and the quick internet -y pieces. I, I think as well there's like a freshness to some stories that have been told previously, like in the Paul McGrath piece in the book, he says, oh, you're the first sports writer I've ever met that actually doesn't remember me playing. I think it's Ryan Bailey is the author. Yeah, yeah like, <laughs> that was one of those, you know, um, you know, when some footballer makes his debut, he was like, oh, this guy was born after, you know, 96 or something. It was one of those moments where I think yeah. Paul McGrath thought, oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm gone out of the game a long time now. <laughs> uh, and Ryan was kind of, it added something actually to the story. I think he's coming at it from a remove that, sure. like the likes of me, <laughs> wouldn't necessarily have. But, but yeah, it was a good angle, actually. The, the interesting thing from your foreword, uh, because it's certainly one of the things that I think whenever I'm reading on the 42, is just the incredible community of commenters there. And it's something you pointed out, fittingly, in your foreword, how important they are to the 42 community. Yeah, like, uh, I tried to take this opportunity. The book is us kind of, we're not particularly good at telling our story or kind of the PR stuff, really. We, we usually just leave the the work stand on its own, but this book was in, a, you know, a push to kind of uh, just talk about ourselves and showcase the, the great team that we have and the stuff we're doing. And the forward for me was an opportunity to kind of set out our stall. And the, the, the audience, as you say, you know, they're massively engaged, you know, yourselves, I'm sure, with the, the, the texts or whatever that come in and tweets or whatever, you know, people are usually knowledgeable, passionate about sport. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're, yeah, well, anyway, uh, and <laughs> they're quick to join the conversation. And w w to be honest, we do, as I say, the book is a product of, of that conversation. Is anti-Dublin bias the most frequent comment on the 42? <laughs> uh, well, we, when we ran through the, the what are we going to call this book, like, how is this news was one, <laughs> or uh, slow news day, question mark, was another one, you know, so that there's a kind of a, a lot of tropes. <laughs> but, yeah, like, I mean, if we, we get called anti, you know, we're, we're told we're too media centric as well sometimes, so when you're, I suppose, you know, yourself, when you're, you're getting it from both sides, I think yeah. you're on the... Yeah, the no, it's, it's true. Your decision to make this a first person story mm. of all of them, like, it, it, it just really works. It's very natural, obviously, once you put them all side by side. Um, getting people to agree to that isn't always easy, particularly when people already have columns or they've done their own books and Absolutely. they kind of feel like they've told their story. So that, I guess that's the hardest part in some ways is like, I'm doing this book. I need your help. Yeah, will, yeah. You, t will you talk to me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I suppose, again, we're lucky, we all work in this industry, so we're lucky that we have certain contacts. Um, so I suppose, you know, I use them. People have been extremely helpful, extremely approachable. Um, I think they all want to talk about it too, don't they? They do, yeah, they do. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, uh, you know, and, and it, they, they were fantastic. They were very revealing and very candid. And it's, it's you know, it's, uh, they particularly talk about, like, life after sport and that, uh, you know, nothing will ever match, you know, playing. And that magic of playing, I mean, involves is gone and they're just worried and concerned that they might never find that again in yeah. their lives basically you know so they're all very honest very very helpful um you know and you know again anybody approached was was just delighted as you said to talk about it talk about their story and stuff you know? yeah and i like i don't know sometimes again like in the industry you can feel a bit like we like we we get criticized for talking too much about doping because you know oh you're always talking about this but actually it becomes a story that you become relatively fascinated with and it makes you a bit cynical about mm. a lot of the stuff that you watch but likewise we're also very interested in the retirement story and you find that people you know, they'll give you interviews about their triumphs and the defeats that mm. they had and the characters that they um, met but they're definitely at their most 
interesting and revealing when they're talking about the difficulties they have immediately afterwards. Mm. And sometimes it feels like, you, you know, we're picking at these scabs a bit too much, but ultimately, I think they want to share those, and I think people want to hear those stories because it gets us behind just the picture of the athletes. And what life really is like. I mean, AP McCoy, who's in the book, I mean, AP, you know, we've seen the documentary being AP and stuff and how revealing that was, you know, and, and life after being a hugely, hugely successful sports star and, yeah. and, and jockey, you know, and how hard he found it just to come to terms with not being involved anymore and just little things about even going to a race meeting in New Toxter or Navan or wherever and not being able to get into the dress room to meet his old colleagues and, his, and jockeys that he would have raced against for years, then he'd have to, have to ring them or text them and say, can you come out and say hello? He wouldn't be allowed in actually, which is quite incredible after 20 years. Uh, and just missing that stuff and, you know, missing talking to Dave Roberts, who was with him for, you know, 20 years as his agent. And yeah. Dave would talk to him three, four times a day. And then suddenly, now they speak maybe once a month just to say hello and kind of catch up. So it's a massive change that way for someone like him that so, has such a structure as we spoke about earlier. He, he also says in it, and it, I think it's the most incredible line in the book, that he doesn't miss making weight. He says that he eats mm. now because it's a novelty, mm. and I'm like, yeah. making weight sounds like the most horrific thing any sports person could ever do. Mm. And he says, no, I actually miss that, yeah. which I thought was incredible. Yeah, yeah I mean, he's, uh, I suppose he's, like, there's only one word to describe AP in my view. He's a machine. Yeah. And, you know, he was that dedicated to a sport, incredibly you know, just obsessed, and that's not overstating it, um, that he was so used to getting up in the morning, doing the sauna, doing the, the cold, the ice baths, mm. eating the proper food and all that, and, you know, trying to get used to, now I can actually eat what I want to eat, but will I, st will I do that? Or will I just stay doing what I always did, what yeah. I'm used to, you know? Like, there's one thing you mentioned there earlier on as well, just about not, not ever being able to get the buzz of being an athlete again. Mm. And Damien Duff puts it very well. He says, it makes me sad that I'll never love something as much as I love mm. football. And, yeah. and he talks about his training and... <laughs> and you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he talks about training and how he kind of gets a bit of glee if a player gets injured and he loves to step in. But then yeah, you yeah. look at sports psychologist Nee Fitzpatrick and she's mm. saying that I've seen retired players step into a coaching role, but they're not really there as a coach. They're there as a coach who still wants to be an athlete. Mm. And that's very revealing because they say the greatest players don't always make the greatest coaches. Well, so that, true. It's probably because they just loved sports uh, yeah. more than a lot of other players. Yeah, and, and I mean, and Damien talks a lot about like you know how frustrating it, it is at times being involved. He's obviously involved with Trent Rovers and just frustrating like watching players not giving maybe the 100% dedication of training and you know that you know or, or not putting in the effort that he feels should be put in that yeah. he would put in if he was still a player. So he found that very frustrating at times, like you know being involved with Rovers and stuff. You know, I'm sure. You guys have obviously um, you're both heavily involved in different strands of the sports media um, apart from publishing books, and yet you kind of wanted the kudos of publishing a book. Like we still love hard copy books. Yeah. Why is that? <laughs> there is something different about having it in your hands and seen it in print is now and just even externally it's kind of moved people's perception I can see people like people like Paul Kimmage are kind of you know looking at the the journalism in a different way I think that he's been very kind you know so I don't know if people just seem to still really put a lot of store in the, the printed word which is, which is great I think yeah I don't think like it's not a Venn diagram where we're trying to you know online is not the enemy of print I wouldn't say like, no totally but but yet like everybody feels like I'd you know, like to do a book I'd like to, so we want to see this thing we want to hold it yeah I think so I, but I, I suppose from my point of view I want I, it was, I felt it was a challenge and 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 you know it was just a new challenge and, yeah. and stepping into the unknown and and you know um you know it's it's just to try something different and 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 that was the reason I did the book, not to not to make millions. We're 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 oh. talking outside. We're not going to make millions out of no. making books, but uh, just the challenge and love of doing something different, and and you know, and and having an idea and just and going with it. And you know, I think anybody that has an idea should just you know yeah, go out there and think about writing the book and stuff. You know, so it's, just go for it. Was it a big decision, Adrian, to put stuff into the book that? was particularly timely at the time because I know that obviously there's a line in the middle of uh, the Robert Gorman piece where he yeah. talks about how McGregor might approach the fight but in actual fact you might look back at that in years to come and you're like remember when we were talking about the analysis yeah. of this fight and how ridiculous it all was yeah they are snapshots we, we did talk about maybe and I did think about having like you know a, a context page in each one or whatever but we were like let's just put the dateline on it and people know 
you know, when you pick up the book, this is when it was written and this is the context that people will understand quickly enough. But, but the amazing thing is, like, you look at the Colin Kaepernick piece in the book, that could have been written yesterday and it yeah. could have still been as relevant as it was. I think it was written in February or March time, so before the season exactly, at all, yeah. so... Yeah, it happened, or it was written by Stephen Orr before it kind of escalated again, but it was still very much relevant and it, it kind of told a story, like, as I said, you're trying to capture different strands of the year as well, so that obviously told a story around a, a big kind of theme throughout the, the calendar year, I suppose. Will you go again, Paul? Is there another book in you? I'd like to, yeah. I yeah. definitely would. I mean, you know, it's just, I suppose, having an idea and coming up with something that people actually would like or would read. I mean, it's, you know, it's a hugely competitive market. You know, it's, it's, I think it's been a great year for books. I think there's been some amazing books out there. Um, but, yeah, would I like to go again? I would. But, you know, if the idea was right, I would, yeah, absolutely. And what, what's your future in TV? Will you go back, do you think, as well? Like, that's, yeah, that's yeah, your passion? I, well, I, yeah, I, 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 I took eight months off to the book. I went back in August. But um, I'm actually finishing on, after 20 years on, right. on Saturday. I'm doing the uh, RT Sports Awards um, uh, on RT on Saturday night. Um, so it's my last show. Uh, so I'm finishing up and heading west and going to do a number of different things. Going doing a bit of lecturing, I've set up kind of an events company as well. Right, okay, congratulations, uh, Jesus. Yeah. So, probably do a bit of farming and possibly write a second book as well. So, yeah, I just wanted to do a number of different things and, and uh, head back home after 20 years in Dublin. Right, okay, because TV kind of, it's a beast. And mm. it, a lot of these things, that the, the production of stuff, it chews you up. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's been 20 great years. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm at Pat outside there, worked with Pat Kenny like 20 years ago on, on Kenny Live. Uh, and off of the match, you know, doing stuff like that, and uh, you know, it's been a fast twenty years. It's flown like and stuff yeah. like you know. Um, but yeah, great to be involved, and and just I mean, I love sport. I mean, so where better place to be? What do you think of the sports media now? Then, what, where do you think we're going? Yeah, I think it's well, I think it's changed considerably. Like you know, I mean, it's it's uh, I mean, this everything's kind of so immediate now. Like you know, with social media and everything, there's no. It's hard to have exclusive now. It's hard to, you know. There's news, you know, even newspapers for tomorrow. Like it, it's it's all so immediate and yeah. so fast and all that. I think getting access to players is, you know, getting more difficult. I think you know, uh, obviously uh, a lot less more meaningful as well. They, they're yeah, not exactly. Giving yeah, and, and getting their time as well and sitting down with players and stuff because it's getting a little more trickier. You know, managers are obviously a lot more stricter now on on, on their on their uh, on their players and their squads and stuff. So that's changed considerably compared to the old days where you could just ring up. You know, somebody and say, "Listen, can I meet you for a cup of tea and do an interview with you?" Or send down a camera to to a county and just do an interview like that. So that's changed for me. That's that's the biggest change, really. Yeah. That just getting access to players and managers and stuff has come a lot more trickier and stuff. You know. Oh, it's been an amazing career. What what do you think about the state of the game at the moment? I think it's really healthy. I think there's a an ecosystem there that I'd like to place ourselves in. That's really creative, and there's a lot of imagination, and people are kind of uh, pushing things on a lot. Even the books this year, for example, are you know it's a really high standard. Mm. There's great journalism. I think if I was a, which I am a sports news consumer, uh, you're kind of spoiled for choice for, you know, stuff throughout the day. Starting with this and you know websites and newspapers still hopefully and um, yeah, I think it's, it's really good. Obviously there's challenges. Yeah. And there's problems, but access is a big one. But uh, I think generally we're we're doing well. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll come back and talk about the uh, challenges in uh, in a later date. But um, your sports books of the year, apart from your own, did you, you, if there's many out there, was the one in particular that you are recommending to people this Christmas? Yeah, I think Jackie Charles one kind of stood up for me. You know, well written by by Christy Christy O'Connor. Uh, I mean, Jackie's an incredible hurler. He's been an incredible sportsman. Uh, it's raw. It's honest. Um, I love that about the book. Um, you see a lot of sports books, and you know, there's certain pieces in it. But you're kind of going, well, he never spoke about that or that or that. But, you know, it was, uh, you know, very honest, very yeah. candid. Uh, some great moments in it. I mean, you know, like, you know, there's one moment I was reading about the end of 2015 where, you know, it was New Year's Day and uh, Jackie out training that morning on New Year's Day, nine o'clock in the cold and the snow. And I think uh, the team were away on a team holiday and he was there in the gym, you know, kind of looking at pictures of the lads in Thailand going, listen, I'm going to be ready when they come back. I'm going to be ready again for 2016. Yeah. You know, um, and, you know, just his relationship with Brian Cody and, you know, Brian being a fantastic manager, but, you know, uh, always been that distance between manager and players and stuff. So I thought it was a really good read. Yeah. Something I would, a book I would definitely recommend, you know. Proper intimacy in that as well. Yeah, I'll have to mention The Choice by Philly McMahon and, and Nile Kelly, which won the two awards. Uh, really amazing book. And The Ascent to Love this year by Barry Ryan. And Dave Hannigan's one, which isn't getting the attention I thought it might deserve, and uh, an American one, Beta Ball by Eric Malinowski about the, the Golden State Warriors, kind of a uh, my ball type. 
Uh, but they came from where they've come exactly, from. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of Silicon Valley kind of. It's good, yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's a really good story. Uh, Tries to be hard probably to be the, the money ball of, of today, which is fair enough. But yeah, it's a really good story. Yeah. Good marketing though, really, isn't it? Yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. This is the money ball of uh, morning <laughs> digital <laughs> uh, shows. And <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly. Lads, great stuff. Best of luck with the two books, and thanks very much thanks for, for uh, joining us um, this morning. Right to play us out, we've got some Lee Dixon in studio with Joe. Another great interview that you can uh, get on podcast tonight. On the radio, it's Thursday night, which means Thursday Night Football with John Giles and also, of course, Graham Hunter on the football show. Uh, Adrian Barry will be in the hot seat bright and early at 7.45 tomorrow with the barriometer uh, being stoked up and fired up as we speak. Set the back four up on the edge of the penalty area and he'd be 20 yards away from us and he'd say, right, I'm the ball, here's the ball under my arm. Wherever I go, you react as if that's on a Saturday. We're going to walk through it. And you've got to react to me. So when I walk towards you, what do you do? And we sort of, you know, we'd back off and then we'd get a certain position on the pitch. I would show the ball inside. Tony Adams would come out to to close the ball down. Then he went across the pitch. Tony would drop off. Steve Bowler would come up. And we'd walk through this um, training session for, you know, it'd just be us four and him. And the rest of the lads would be over on the other pitch doing shooting practice, having a load of fun, enjoying themselves and, we used to do this virtually every day of our life, and then he'd introduced a few um, a few attacking players. And before long, he introduced forwards against defenders, where the whole team basically would take the back four on and a goalkeeper, and we'd have Paul Davis, one midfield player, sitting in front of the back four.